Sorry, guys. Okay, Happy New Year, everybody. For the Owen Grove, we get to say Happy New Year a tad earlier than everybody else. So this is the day when the sun transitions from the yew tree into the birch tree. So this is the beginning of a brand new solar cycle through the Owen Grove. And today's presentation is about the birch tree, in particular, the medicine uh, provided by the birch tree and its symbiont fungi. Now, um, of course, with herbalism, there's a couple of rules. Uh, the first rule is um, do your research. You know, we're not all the same. Some of us can eat a bowl of peanuts and one of us could die just eating one peanut if there's an allergic reaction, you know. So um, today, today's presentation is an overview, but intelligent herbalist herbalism has to regard the individual person and their makeup you know so do your research so this is just an overview of the benefits provided by birch tree etc um i'm not a qualified herbalist so i'm studying and learning too but some years ago around about uh, i don't know about 2010 I did a beginner's course in herbalism, but the herbalism I was studying was Ayurvedic rather than British Isles or, or whatever, you know. And of course, there's so many different types of herbalism, like traditional Chinese herbalism and Native American herbalism and stuff, you know. So we're in a in a new era where we're one world. It's a global internet, you know, and we can bring all our insights together. Of course, I don't know everything. Uh, what I did learn. In the beginner's course in Ayurvedic herbalism is one of their first rules, and I think this is really important, especially with fungi, mushrooms. The first rule in Ayurvedic herbalism was everything is medicine, everything is poison, and it's all about quantity, you know. So, for instance, the fly agaric mushrooms often described as being deadly poisonous, you know, it's about quantity. Um, a bowl of paracetamol would be deadly poisonous, but two, two capsules of paracetamol is the dosage. It's the same with some fungi, you know, you're talking about a micro dose, but again, do your research sort of thing. So that warning aside, um, we tread gently and explore. Now for the next 18 days because each tree uh, lasts about 18 days with the cycle of the year um, we go into rowan tree on the 17th of january so between now and the 17th of january we can use the facebook group to put feedback and other notes about everything i talk about now you know so really i'm just opening the lid of the box and uh, it's going to be an overview really but for the next 18 days we could share ideas on facebook about some of the things i talk about so i'm just going to bring the powerpoint up and then talk through the pictures right Okay, so I love this photo. Um, <clears throat> the birch tree then um, is known as a pioneer tree. And what does that mean? Well, for the British Isles, which is the Celtic worldview that I'm exploring, um, it was part of the Ice Age, of course. There nothing grew here once upon a time. And then the ice age began to recede and the ice began to melt and the pioneer trees were three and birch was one of the first ones. So it's called the pioneer tree because it claimed the land when the ice receded. There were three pioneer trees, birch, pine and the juniper bush. You know, they were the first three pioneers into the landscape after the ice left 
And so Birch has been with us for a very, very long time before human beings, really. Now, that it's a romantic idea, but it's kind of backed up. Along with the birch tree, one of its symbiont fungi is the famous fly agaric Amanita muscaria mushroom, and reindeer eat those. So as the birch forest spread into the icy landscape, the red mushrooms popped up and the reindeer munched them. And the reindeer create the first tracks into the virgin landscape following the birch trees. And the theory is that, you know, human beings followed the reindeer tracks, you know, and that's all the law of Ellen of the Ways and so on. Um, <clears throat> so birch is a pioneer tree for that reason. And it's curious that uh, it's the first tree of the Owen. It's like somehow that was in the memory that the, the birch is the beginning of the new world or the new landscape or the new season, whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> quite interestingly, there's some things further on about just how significant it's been to us in an ancestral way for European things. Now, on the face on the YouTube channel for the Owen Grove, we've already done a whole year. So there is a YouTube clip for each tree in the Owen Grove. And there's one there for the birch tree. And the one there is called Gathering Around the Grove Birch 2022. So you can go and look at that. You know, that that's the basic overview of birch law, if you like, and how logically it related to the goddess Ellen of the Ways and, and a few other aspects of Celtic mythology, if you like. So we're not doing that again. I'm, I'm not going to be repetitive. So this, this cycle, as we've said, is focusing on the medicine of the birch tree. Um, so if you want the basic law, look for the 2022 YouTube clip. Now, <clears throat> Ellen of the Ways, I, uh, you know, it's there's a lot there with Ellen and we'll come back to it. But I, I kind of give Birch the nickname of Way Clearer. And we've already touched on that with it being a pioneer tree, you know, um, and depicted in this artwork, there's the reindeer eating the fly agaric mushrooms. Now, <clears throat> for the Owen Grove year wheel, then this medicine wheel that we're doing, looking at the medicine of all 20 trees. We're in the first quarter of the year uh, in Gaelic known as the Akuma Beef. So this whole quarter is named after the birch tree. Okay, birch is the first tree of this quarter. If you look at the bottom of the picture, you can see yew tree at the very bottom and to the left is the birch tree. So that's the beginning of the rising of energy, you know, after the winter solstice with the yew tree, there's the rising. So this is like first stirrings under the ground, which is gonna push bulbs up and bring sap back up the trees to put energy into buds and things like this. So the whole quarter of the Akma beef is this rising energy. Now, each quarter also has a Celtic fire festival. So the fire festival of this Akma is Imbolc. And the figurehead for Imbolc, of course, is the goddess Brigid, Bridey Brigantia, Brigid. And amongst many other things like inspiration and poetry, she is a goddess of healing. Now, that's really exciting and enticing. And I confess, that's a, the end of my knowledge with that, you know, I, whether there is traditional Irish herbalism, I don't know, I'm happy to learn. And although Bridey Bridget is a goddess of healing, I'm not aware of any traditional manuscripts that explain the methods of healing that she's famous for, you know, other than whatever indigenous herbalism the, the Gaelic Celts had, you know, but this, it's just that she's goddess of healing. So 
she's really important to the coming era because we're shifting from the Piscean age into the age of Aquarius. And the age of Aquarius will hold a cosmic in bulk. So for the next two and a half thousand years, Bridey, Bridget, is the figurehead for planet Earth from a Celtic perspective. So that focus on healing is really important. And I think with the meditation later, it might be interesting to almost invoke Bridget uh, as a guide for relearning um, medicine, you know, what with my presentation here, it will become quite apparent about how disconnected and detached modern people are from the medicines that are out there, you know, that we rely so much on the chemist shop and the big pharmacies, you know, that the medicines are all around us in the hedgerows, um, but we've lost the knowledge. And there may be reasons why we've lost the knowledge. But anyway, enough of that. <clears throat> It's a picture I did for Bridie Bridget. Now, <clears throat> um, an, an interesting thing going back with this is that um, going through the Akma then, you've got the birch tree, um, which we're looking at today, and then Rowan is the tree of Bridie with the healing and everything, takes us to Imbolc. And then the older tree is in Welsh law is all wrapped up with the cauldron of inspiration, the cauldron of Anuin in the story of Bran and Branwen. And the willow tree is the nine maidens that keep the cauldron of Anuin warm. Now, what we do have in Welsh Celtic mythology is the story of Ceridwen and her cauldron. So apart from this quarter being Bridey and Imbolc, it's also the quarter of the cauldron. And in the Haynes Taliesin, Ceridwen collects every day different charm bearing herbs, you know, so, and her story is a year wheel story. So that's really interesting. So with Bridey stroke Ceridwen, these are figureheads for the Celtic healing and the Celtic plant law and charm bearing herbs and what have you. So all that said, I'll just have a swig of juice. So the birch tree then, basic herbalism from it. Now, of the, all the trees, it's incredibly generous and incredibly giving. And every bit of it provides medicine. For herbalism, basic herbalism, the bark, the twigs, the buds, the leaves, all of it can be used and all of it can be turned into tea or tinctures, you know. So um, in a very real way, you can gather birch twigs and leaves and start drinking birch tea. You can buy it online, but you can gather it yourself as well. Um, there's plenty of websites and YouTube clips showing you how to do that. Now, the benefits of birch tea is it's anti-inflammatory so it helps with rheumatic pains and just reducing inflammation of the joints in the body and so on it's also diuretic so it flushes out toxins from the body uh, it can help with urinary infections it just flush it all away and it's a gen you know that general tonic is good for the liver and the kidneys as well, you know, so it, because of that, it improves people's skin. It makes your skin health be healthy because the liver and kidneys are healthier again, you know, so it's just a general good cleansing tonic, the tree itself. Now, <clears throat> that's general kind of herbalism. Now, for, for the English speaking world, I don't know about German and French European herbalists and stuff, but this chap, uh, Culpepper, Nicholas Culpepper, is the original writer of herbalism, if you like. He was writing in the 1640s, maybe 1630s. And you can get his book. I've got a copy here. It's quite cheap. It's quite thick. It's maybe about 400 pages. And it's just Culpepper's Complete Herbal. Um, it's worth looking, looking him up. Now, 
it's the beginning, if you like, of uh, Renaissance Europe and um, the beginning of science and the beginning beginning of chemistry and the beginners, beginning of pharmacy and all of that. You know, what's important with Nicholas Culpepper is, apart from it being the earliest written evidence that we have in a kind of intelligent scientific way, although many herbalists today question him and they might be right to so we've moved on with our knowledge banks and stuff but look at his era he's the 1600s now um this is this he was gathering all this information together at the same time that the witch hysteria was happening and all those midwives and herbalists were being killed and burnt and so on you know so nicholas culpepper is really a kind of salvage yard of the herbal law that we had in England and the British Isles, you know, before before modern pharmacies, if you like, you know, with the killing of the midwives and herbalists, we, we lost so much law. And that's important in regards to Keridwen and the Welsh bardic tradition and the physicians of Mudvai and all of that, because, you know, the Keridwen story was written down in the 15th century and her gathering charm bearing herbs every day for a whole year. The closest we can get to that kind of knowledge bank is the 17th century writings of Nicholas Culpepper, you know, as flawed and as questionable as they may be, you know. But it's important if you're trying to reach back to late medieval herbal law. Other than that, it's maybe, I don't know, manuscripts in Latin by monastery monks in their herb gardens, you know. But Nicholas Culpepper was the first to try and make herbalism a science, if you like. Now, for the birch tree, um, he says it's a tree of Venus. But then there's no explanation as to how or why, you know, what what makes birch tree governed by Venus? I would love to know, you know, I'm not discounting it, but his passage on the birch tree is little more than half a page and it's just a passing reference. It's a tree of Venus. And then he goes on to explain how uh, the tea made of its twigs and leaves and bark and everything helps to dissolve kidney stones and gallbladder stones you know um whether that's backed up by modern science i don't know um i'm still learning and then he recommends uh again quite early he recommends the tapping of the birch tree which is something that's now known you know it's kind of a I've got mixed feelings about it. What you you can drill a hole into a birch tree, maybe four inches deep, and you do it slightly at an angle going upwards, and you put a tube in there, and it will hemorrhage its sap, and you can gather its sap. and And there are some companies now selling birch sap water, and it's meant to be a good general tonic, which is what Nicholas Culpepper says. Now. My mixed feelings about this are that um, you can only do it in the early spring when the, before it's matured its leaves, you know, and you mustn't overdo it or you hurt the tree. So it is a bit like being a human mosquito and sapping its blood, you know, so you've got to be careful. Now, the, the reason I've got mixed feelings about it is because you can get all of the health benefits that the sap gives you by making a tea from its twigs and leaves and buds and bark. So you don't need to take its sap. Um, so that said, it, it's very popular idea, especially with kind of uh, Bushman craft, you know, how to drink from a tree. It's, there's loads of YouTube clips on it. Um, yes. Uh, like I say, I've got mixed feelings about the, whether it's kind to the tree or not. Um, but another thing from the birch tree, and this is modern stuff, is there is a sweetener now called xylitol, and it's made from the birch tree sap. Um, 
I'm, I'm not completely sure of the process of making it. Xylitol is translates from the Greek language as just wood sugar, but it's specifically the birch tree. Now, what's unique with xylitol or birch tree sugar? contrary to all other sugars and, and sweeteners, is it actually has lots of health benefits. And the strangest one is that it is good for your teeth. It's the only sweetener or sugar that is good for your teeth. Chewing gum now has xylitol as its main sweetener and it's in toothpaste and it actually destroys the bacteria that cause tooth decay and, and there's some evidence that it can even restore cavities in the teeth so that's a fascinating thing there's loads of other health benefits too like if you've got type 2 diabetes you can eat this it doesn't spike your blood sugar levels at all it just doesn't register it's not the same so for people with type 2 diabetes xylitol is a must you know you can sprinkle it on your porridge and everything you know there's a an amazing thing from modern use of the birch tree. So <clears throat> uh, mushrooms then, fungi. This one <clears throat> is the first one, there's three actually. Uh, this one's called birch polypore. Um, polypore means there's lots of different pore holes underneath. So it's called a polypore. And there's loads of health benefits from this fungi. Again, it can be taken from the tree and turned into a tea um, and it could be consumed that way. And it's quite a magic super herb. Um, it supports the immune system is its main thing. It is antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antibacterial, and antiparasites. And that's quite interesting. So if you were unlucky enough to have some sort of worms in your intestines, this thing would get rid of it for you as a tea. You know, you could get rid of those parasites in your gut, literally. And there is evidence of it really helping people with cancer. You know, the modern science is looking at it as a way of uh, combating many different types of cancer. It's meant to improve cancer situations by up to 60% um, just by drinking this tea. You know? uh, it grows on birch trees that are dying. So it's not on the young birch trees. It's the trees that are in their old age uh, start to decay and this birch polypore starts to grow out of it. Look at this guy. If you don't know Otzi the Iceman, he's Europe's oldest mummified body. It dates back to 3200 BC and he was found in the Alps between Austria and Italy. Now, the reason I've put him in there is because amongst his mummified body were many of his belongings and which included two separate pieces of the birch polypore, which I've just shown you. And he would be using it. They actually x-rayed him and he had some sort of worm in the gut, you know, so he was drinking this to try and get rid of his own worms, you know. The health knowledge on this mummy is astounding. And also you can use the, per the birch polypore for kinder, you can light your fire by getting a small spark in there. It will start to burn as an ember. So he probably used it for medicine and for starting fires. Now, another interesting thing with him is his body is covered in little tattoos. And the tattoos relate to pain management, acupressure points in his body that x-rays confirmed he had various pain problems because of injury and stuff. Now, just because of the Owen Grove, it's worth noting a few of the belongings he had, and I'll bring it back to the birch tree, but he had an axe with a copper blade 
but the axe handle was made of yew, yew tree. And he had a knife which had an ash handle. And then he also had a long bow which was made of yew. And in the yew session, we talked about yew use as a long bow. So even as far back as 3200 BC, it's the tree of the archer, you know. What's nice with Otzi's long bow is it was unfinished. So he was actually in the process of making his long bow, you know, incredible window of history. Now back to Birch, he also had two little pouches, but they're small baskets and they were made of birch bark. So he's using the birch polypore mushroom for medicine and kindling, but he's also got um, bags or baskets made of birch bark. Incredible. <clears throat> now, here's another symbiont of the birch tree. This is quite famous now. It's a growth, it's a fungal, fungal growth that happens on birch trees and it's called chaga, C-H-A-G-A. Chaga. And it's known throughout the whole Northern Hemisphere, of course. So uh, Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine use it, Native American medicine uses it, you know, and it's been used in Siberia for a long time and so on. And Chaga has a whole load of health benefits as well. Um, so look at it this way, you can tap the tree for its sap but you can only do that for a month or for about a month in the early spring, then you can't do it because you harm the tree. Um, the birch polypore is there and then it's gone. It's like a fungus that comes and goes. Whereas the twigs and the leaves you can gather all year round and use all year round. And this chaga grows slowly on the side of the tree and it's there all year round. So this is ever present, like the twigs and the leaves and stuff, you know. Now, some of these growths can grow uh, for 50 years, you know. If it's about the size of your fist, it's probably about 10 years old, you know. And so if it's as big as a dinner plate or a car steering wheel, it's like 50 years old. Now, the, the thing to be mindful of is that um, the older and bigger the lump of chaga is, the more potent it is medicinally. So there's a danger with modern day people harvesting small pieces, which is over harvesting and it's not as potent a medicine, you know? So it, it needs intelligent farming to let these fist sized pieces grow to be 40 years old, 50 years old and get the benefits from that. So there's a lesson there, I think, of the birch tree providing twigs and leaves every day all year round and chaga every day all year round. But there's also a lesson of responsibility of not taking too much sap and not over harvesting so that there's none left for the next generation. You know, it needs intelligent management of the forests really in wide countries like siberia and canada it's not a problem because there's so much forest you know um but in places like britain um there aren't a lot you know so you've got, i think you've got to go up to scotland to find bits of chaga it, it, and people have already started over harvesting it and selling it online as, as dried powder for tea making but um chaga it's a potent antioxidant, it's anti-inflammatory, helps with arthritis, it helps balance blood pressure. So if you've got high blood pressure, it will bring it down. It will help manage high blood sugar levels. So it balances out the blood sugar levels. So again, good for type two diabetes. Um, and it slows the growth. It's, this is proven scientifically, it slows the growth of cancer cells again. So along with the birch polypore, the chaga is an anti-cancer medicine. So you could either drink tea of the birch polypore or chaga tea, and it's gonna help uh, make cancer situations better than they are. 
it's high in potassium and magnesium and they're looking into it now science in china it's uh, meant to be helping the battle against alzheimer's disease now this lovely fellow i took this photo in november this was in a field barely 50 yards from me and um it very much triggered my intent to want to look at a medicine wheel if you like you know such a beautiful thing and I, I did a clip of it and I actually said what to do what to do what to do you know like I, what do you do with this thing you know and I have since done a lot a lot of research online and helped by other people that have done lots of research now like like a lot of people I've always thought this was deadly poisonous and you know don't even touch it is, is kind of the attitude towards it but it's wrong that's just not what it is you know there's countries um siberia latvia other countries in eastern europe that eat it as a regular food you know it's edible you have to prepare it properly of course you know so you have to boil it three times to get rid of the toxins but then once it's once you've boiled out the toxins, it's an edible mushroom and, and many countries do eat it. So back to what I said at the beginning about everything being medicine, everything being poison, you know, it's all about dosage. So yes, can be very poisonous or toxic, um, but actually there are far worse mushrooms than this one. And it just needs learning and being treating with respect. So. I gathered it and I dried it and I put my pieces in a jar and I'll show you that shortly. You have to dry it so that it's biscuit crisp. You want to get rid of all of the moisture and that changes its chemical makeup, you know, so it contains hypertonic acid when it's wet. And, and and that can be quite nasty. That make you vomit and be sick and so on, you know. But when it's dry, when it's biscuit dry, that ibotonic acid transforms into something called a muscimol. And muscimol has lots of benefits for us. It's a medicine. Um, but again, it's about the sensible dosage. So there's a really good um, website called amanitadreamer.net. Uh, Amanita Dreamer is a lady, I think she's in Canada, or North America anyway, and she's dedicated years to investigating the fly agaric mushroom Amanita muscaria, uh, and she's put tons of video clips on her website looking at all the science and how you can work with it, and she's also a little bit what would you say for want of a better word uh new age a little bit shamanic a little bit into the medicine and the visionary work as well so but on a micro dose on a tiny little bit micro dosing muscimol from the plygaric mushroom helps reduce stress and anxiety it could really help people with post-traumatic stress disorder and digestion prob problems born of anxiety related collapse of the digestive system, you know, and it also promotes restorative sleep without using more hardcore drugs from big pharma, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a gentler way. Too much of it and you'll start having visions and, and, and hallucinating, of course, you know, but too much of many pharmaceutical drugs are going to have a dodgy side effect. You know, so it's about the intelligent use of the fly agaric mushroom. Now, before we end, and I don't have much knowledge about this, but there is also, I know rosemary's here, that there's birch tree as a flower essence. And that's wonderful and brilliant. The trouble I had investigating it online is there's many people producing flower essences. and the benefits of birch tree flower essence seems to differ from producer to producer. So I'm not criticizing any of that. It just seems to be what it is. You know, it, 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 
it's about the intent of the person making the flower essence, I think, you know. Um, the, the most famous flower essences, I suppose, the ones that started it are the bark flower remedies. And some of the trees of the Irwin are in the bark flower remedies, but the birch tree isn't. Um, but I did find that there's a, you know, there's a thing in Northern England called Findhorn and Findhorn make flower essences and they do a birch tree flower essence too. And I'm sure some of you here do, uh, but this is from the Findhorn website. They say birch flower essence helps to open your mind and broaden your outlook. And it's great for banishing uncertainty and worry. And I thought that was quite interesting that it banishes uncertainty and worry when the fly agaric mushroom muscamole also reduces stress and anxiety, that there is something there about the birch tree being the way clearer, you know. Now, what I'm quite keen on is that I think there's many other ways of working with the essence of the tree. So like here, just even having a piece of birch wood in your hand is a flower essence of sorts. You've actually got a bit of birch wood in your pocket, you know. And also something I'm very keen on is what I call tree breathing, which is to consciously stand underneath a birch tree and breathe for half an hour, you know, so that's a that's getting birch essence as much as a flower essence, you know, so it's but it's a much more empathic, uh, subjective connection with the tree, isn't it? It's harder to evaluate than regular herbalism or the, the effects of mushrooms uh, and so on you know but I, I'm all for flower essences and tree breathing and stuff but it, we need to use the Facebook group to share our insights about all of that so that's my PowerPoint presentation and uh, so you can put your microphones back on and we can chat for 10 minutes or so and then we'll do our meditation to the birch tree very good. Excellent. Thank you, Laurie. I had a couple of signs come up saying uh, my internet connection was unstable, so I just hope it was all right. Well, you had um, 20, 32 people. Yeah. 37? 27, yeah. I think. You know, one thing about the, the Venus and the Culpepper, you know, I, I, I actually studied him in, um, when I lived in London in the 60s. Um, but the v, just, just looking at Venus rules in it, like he was very, he was an astrologer too. And Venus rules the kidneys. So when you were talking about Venus and why it relates to the kidneys. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, aspirin is also like from birch. Yes. Willow. Willow as well, isn't it? Aspirin. Yeah. Oh, it's willow. Is it willow and birch? No, it's certainly willow. It's meadow sweet. Oh, meadow sweet. There are so many. Okay. Now, maybe I'm not right with the birch and the aspirin. It's willow. Willow. Yeah, willow. Okay. I was. Yeah, Thank I you. have a question. How do you spell cold pepper? I couldn't read it on the slide. Uh, Anybody? C U L P E P E R. And the name of the book again? Complete Herbal. The Complete Herbal <laughs> by Nicholas okay. Culpepper. In London, they had a fantastic, this was in the late 60s when I was there, they had a fantastic Culpepper herbal shop. And uh, uh, I don't know if it's still there, probably. Yeah, it was in the uh, public. I, I, oh, sorry. It's still very nice to have. Oh, shit, raise my hand. <laughs> Andy? Back school. Sorry, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, great presentation. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I had one theory about when a, a plant's assigned to a planet. You know, there's that thing where you get the, like if it has five petals, perhaps I know a lot of flowers do have five petals, but 
um, sometimes inside the stalk, you know, like what, what was it? The Aspen had yes. the uh, pentagram. Yeah. I was wondering maybe Birch has the same, but I, I don't think it does. So, but that's a, a theory. Hmm. Just coming back to the um, Venus relation with, um, I heard like multiple times about the, the birch having connections with the feminine aspect of the world. And also Venus is, when I think about Venus, I think about Aphrodite or, you know, like feminine as well, I think. Yeah, just yeah. It can be a connection with that as well. One of it, it soothes emotions. It doesn't stimulate thought, right? It's working on the emotional body, not not stimulating thinking. Yes. Yeah. And one of her names is um, Birch's traditional name, as far as I know, is Lady of the Woods. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's yeah. the Venus connection. For me, she comes across as a really feminine deity a really feminine sort of um aspect this is utterly subjective but i i kind of see the yew tree as nematona she of the grove and anyway it's a i think with all of the hidden pentagrams in the owen grove that venus is there constantly uh, but then like the after the winter solstice the first expression being ellen you know and that ellen is the green woman the pure perfect ray of sunlight after the rebirth of the sun and she's carrying that ray of sunlight to the rowan tree and that's bridey who is the bridget the the goddess of this acma and her main symbol is this in eternal flame or fire of inspiration so we had this image last year of the rebirth of the sun Ellen being the ray of light, and then Bridie holding that creative fire that then goes into the cauldron and the inspiration and the healing and the poetry and all of that sort of stuff. But it is all she of the grove. It is all feminine, isn't it? You know, and all of the trees are connected by these four pentagrams as well. But why Culpepper would say Venus, that, that yeah. Good ideas. In the book on forest bathing, it talks about standing under the trees because they exude molecules, and they can measure this, exude molecules that are healing and soothing. And, and so they can you know, give us a scientific verification that hanging out under the trees is really good for us. Yeah. So, there is this tradition in China of uh, people doing qigong every morning, and, and also a, a lot of people will deliberately go under a tree, and, and they are actually breathing under the tree or breathing with the tree's aura in the morning in some way. But I don't know if specific trees give specific medicines in that Chinese methodology, or whether they're just happy to do qigong under any tree or, or whether they're literally deliberately doing a pine tree or a birch tree or so on i don't know that, that is something i want to learn but that would go along with what you just said franklin about they're actually wow. doing some sort of science to it yes i mean i hang out under different well like different groves of different trees and the silver birch has a very different energy to oak or to you so there definitely is a different feeling quality to go and spend time when you see a group of trees of one species and beech is different again, or rowan or hawthorn, they each have a particular quality and an energy. And, and I always find the silver birch is a beautiful one down on the Shapwick, uh, on the heath there, is always a very light golden energy. It's almost a bit fake bubbly. Um, but also very calming as well in a strange sort of way. Um, which is interesting that the, the sort of herbs actually, the sort of the medicine from it is actually, it calms the system down, but it's also energizing. I, 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 yeah. 
I don't want to jump to conclusions, but you know, looking at Otzi the Iceman, it's before they were literate people, you know, so you kind of wonder if they're a bit more empathic with their landscape. And I think the the re learning to read and write changes our brain a little bit, kills the intuition and empathy a little bit. And what was fascinating with all of his items, he was the first ACMA going from the yew tree to the ash tree. His woods were yew, birch and ash. He, all of his equipment is the first ACMA. It was just mm. amazing coincidence too of, of a, a pre-literate culture, but that are maybe more intuitive with their natural resources and stuff. That you would just empathically know what trees to be drawn to and, and, and yeah. I think much of, you know, um, trees obviously send the healing and the communication to each other under the ground. And I think that when we stand with them, they're sending that up through to us as well. And we can, you know, work with that. Yes, definitely. I've known since I was a teenager tripping in the woods that the fungi were the organs of the forest. I, I've, I've been telling people that for 50 years, that this is how the forest knows we're here. They can hear us, they sense us, and it's through these little fungi that we see. I just knew it intuitively, because it's true. <laughs> well, I think about the fungi, you know, they absorb the symbiotic relationships, so they absorb some of those medicinal qualities from the trees are symbiotic with. And I've, um, I was taught to make a pain relieving tincture with amanita where you use topically, you're not using it, you know, you're not ingesting it, but it, it um, works really well for like sciatica. It's kind of that same area, like with the kidneys, you know, the sciatica and the, that lower back stuff. So when you dry them, did you dry them in a dehydrator or did you just dry them naturally? Dry what? Who? The, the mushrooms. Did you dry them in a dehydrator or did you <laughs> dry naturally? Um, I've, I've got uh, in my room, I've got a, an electric heater and I suspended a long metal ruler above the heater with kitchen paper. And I just put the mushroom on there and it dried out slowly. Oh, so the, the, the room smelt um, quite pungent. And I had I had some interesting dreams just on the fumes yeah you know so a little bit like mugwort in that way you know you can you don't have to drink mugwort tea you can just put it by your pillow and you'll get you'll get some dreams and uh, so here's my um well it's gonna do the funny thingy there yeah i've still got some left and so the the first time i did it so this lady Amanita Dreamer, obviously not a real name, but it's her internet name, and her website's amanitadreamer.net. So she talks about microdosing, and of course I'm quite not scared, but cautious with, with the fly agaric mushroom. So I, 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 I had a bit about the size of my thumbnail. That's all I had, and I and went to bed with that, and I had, I had two very lovely dreams with it, you know. Um, the first was, uh, I actually found myself in this idealized bedroom in a lovely bed with a lovely duvet. And, and I was sitting on the bed like Alice in Wonderland and I was using a little pen knife, peeling bits of Amanita mushroom. Like I had a whole cap and I was slicing little bits off and, and the pieces were falling on the bed like flower petals and they were heart shapes uh, and they were, beetroot red and they were crispy so they were like beetroot crisps that were heart shapes or but they were like bits of love falling on the bed and then uh the room was full of rainbow light prisms and one prism was on a picture on a wall and it was actually a picture of my uncle tom and auntie eileen and they were a perfect couple they're both dead now but i've actually got a book of handwritten poems by my uncle Tom, which I intended to publish one day. And most of them are love poems to Eileen. Of course, Eileen is an mm. Irish version of Ellen, but um, yeah, so it was all about love. And then, then I woke up and then I went back to sleep 
and I had a very, 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 very rude, sexy, erotic dream, which was quite brilliant. <laughs> you know, and and the the vivid details, you know, uh, of even the hairs and the freckles on the other person's body, the details were incredible. And so the next night, I thought, well, I have more of that. That was pretty good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the next night, I had about twice as much and nothing happened nothing happened um all that happened is that i felt really dopey for the whole day afterwards like a hangover you know so i went back to the amanita dreamer website and and she talks about microdosing you know and so a microdose is a tiny tiny piece like half a fingernail tiny and then she talks about macrodosing uh, a macrodosing is something much more shamanic you know that you you are trying to get out of your body a little bit with it you know and, and, and go to the other world and then she talks about hero dosing which you know like elizabeth here is that you know you leave your body entirely if you eat the whole flipping mushroom you know um so that that's my experience that's all i've done all i've done is micro dosing and since the second time when i took too much and i got nothing but a hangover I went back to taking tiny little bits and I've had nice, nice, nice dreams. Yeah. Go on to the next hour. Oh, it's not time yet. Yeah. So right. that's my experience so far. And I still got some left. But, um, yeah. I didn't take any over Christmas because I was with the family. And then we... <laughs> yeah, I, I had quite an astonishing experience. Um in the autumn after picking a load yori and I'd picked him with Anya and like I'd been at a musical jam like the next night and then when I came down the hill yeah after I could just see these little red and white mushrooms everywhere and I you know I hadn't I hadn't eaten any of them but they they were really this the spirit of them was really present following me around and I, I found that it, it's very powerful medicine. I've actually also got a friend uh, in, near where we live who's, uh, I could say he's quite obsessive really about them. And, um, you know, he has his own channel on YouTube and stuff. And I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it because it is quite full on, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, it the is symbolism worth, for them is everywhere. Yeah. It's ubiquitous. It's just like, it's incredible. It is worth looking at Amanita Dreamer's video clips on YouTube and on her website because she does talk about what you've just said about how there is almost like Amanita has a relationship with you and a bit like mugwort. You don't even have to eat it. If it's in the room, it's almost there as a plant spirit guide companion, yeah. you know. And she also said if you don't even remember your dreams, it's still having cellular rest restoring brain cells and helping with stress and anxiety and all the rest of it and stuff it's doing its job sort of thing. yeah but yeah, respect for medicines you know it might be yeah. best to eat a whole one yeah well it's you know it's interesting you're speaking about it because i mean i kind of had <clears throat> not thought about the experience i had but that you're talking about it it was I mean, I didn't, I had never actually left my body completely like I did when I ate. I ate more than like the one you showed. <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody stopped me. <laughs> like, you know, I was literally, I was watching, I, I you know, I could, I, I actually stayed back in camp to help the, move the kitchen. And, I could see them moving the kitchen and I wanted to get up and help them and I couldn't because I was out of my body it was quite I mean you know so talking about it it was like you know being this was in the 70s that I you know I hadn't haven't thought about it but you know what an incredible experience it was not one I would probably do again <laughs> like but I'm not just the I'm not dismissing it at all. Um, and I'm very interested in psychic research and everything. But I have a friend from a Essex folk magic background, 
And the, the general consensus with him and his background was that, you know, you try and just learn to be psychic anyway, and you should be able to do it sober. But sometimes things like this were used to jumpstart people that just couldn't break through the veil, if you like, you know, that it is a doorway drug, you know, and um, yeah, it's a Kickstarter for people, but it shouldn't become a lifestyle either. And, and it's probably just as well that these mushrooms are just there once a year in the autumn, you know, that they're not available all year round, you know, a bit like the psilocybin mushrooms, you know, people, you can gather them and dry them, but the fact that they're not constantly available might be quite a good thing as well because it's it's very easy to get addicted to your medicines uh, as well uh, tricky okay um i'll stop recording and please use the facebook group to share more ideas about what we've been looking at um and put your microphones off now and we'll do the meditation to the birch tree